words. The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister Stephen Hunter. Anytime somebody asks me for a book recommendation just for pleasurable reading, I always go to one of my favorites, which is Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Uh, the entire premise of the book uh, contains a chief character by the name of Guy Montag, who is a fireman. But the fire department in this book doesn't operate like our fire department today. Rather, in this dystopian novel, the fire department goes around and finds people who has books, and they pile all those books up, and they set them ablaze. The reason the book is named Fahrenheit 451 is because at 451 degrees, paper will ignite on fire. And so the whole premise of this book is simply that the government controls the information that the people receive, and uh, because the government has that sort of control, anybody that has a book may learn something and may think differently than what they're being taught to think. And so what you see in this short novel, it's not very long, you see what a society looks like without books to guide our thinking. And one of the books that isn't allowed in this novel is, in fact, the Bible. And so it makes you think, ultimately, springboarding from this, what does a society look like that doesn't have God's Word as a part of its makeup? Essentially, what Judah had been uh, until Josiah came on the scene, it had been a society that lacked the law of God. And throughout its history, you had people who would ultimately lead the society, lead the nation further down the roads of idolatry and away from God. But every once in a while, you would have a good king here or there that would rise up and they would have the mind and the heart for God and want to get back on track. Josiah is probably the final, but yet one of the greatest of those monarchs in that time. And so when he is the age of about 26, he orders a restoration of the temple. You may recall from a couple of weeks ago, when Josiah was 16, he began earnestly seeking God. And obviously, when we earnestly seek the Lord, we're going to progress in our walk with the Lord. And there will be things of our lives that we will eliminate simply because they are diametrically opposed to God. And so Josiah is doing this. He's tearing down all the emblems of idolatry. And as he progresses in his, seat, uh, excuse me, in his search of God, ultimately what he does is he looks to the house of God. And by this time, the house had been, the temple that is, had been long neglected. It needed repairs badly. And so he commissions folks to go and to renovate the temple. The last time the temple had been renovated was by a predecessor of his, Joash, two centuries before this time. But Josiah now is undertaking this task in order to faithfully seek the Lord. Now, one of the things that, uh, that I find is, is encouraging is that in the book of Jeremiah, when God is telling Judah that they would go into exile, he says to them, while they're in exile, that they'll find him if they search for him. He says, there you will find me if you search for me with your whole heart. And so there's a distinction there. Some people say, well, I search for God. But do we search for God with our whole heart? Because the promise that God made to the Jews was that when you search for me with your whole heart, you, I will be found by you. So he promises, if you really seek me, you will find me. I will make myself available to you in that regard. And Josiah is one king who earnestly and sincerely seeks the Lord. And all the measures that he's undertaking as monarch to lead the nation back to godliness demonstrates that. And as God reveals Himself to Josiah and to the nation, little by little, there comes a point when they're renovating the temple. 
And you have to think, because idolatry had flourished in the land at this time, the priesthood likely had been disassembled. It didn't function for the temple as it did. The temple probably had cobwebs all over it, and there were probably things that uh, people didn't know were in there. It, it, it's almost like some of those places that were built once upon a time for a purpose, maybe a business or something, but now all they're used for is storage. And so some of you may know of some places here in Murray that you go, well, I remember when they built this, they built it to use it for this purpose, but now it just has a bunch of junk in it. Went and looked at a house recently, and the lady, uh, she was showing us back to this, this uh, garage behind the house. I call it a garage, a, a workshop. And, and it had become pretty much a, a storage place at that point because it just wasn't functioning as it was intended to function. But as they're going through the temple, they're, they're sifting through, and, and, and they find the book of the law of the Lord. And what you see in the account given to us by Chronicles, what was lost in society now becomes found. And in 2 Chronicles 34, 14, when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Now, most of us, here's the thing, most of us do not suffer from a one of God's Word. Several of us in our homes probably have more than one Bible. I know each of us in my house, there are four of us, we each have at least one Bible, but me being a preacher, you know, I can't just have one. There's a rule. When you're a preacher, you have to have many, many, many copies. That's written in the law of preaching. And so you go and buy, and when I buy a new one, I have to hide it because my wife, why'd you get a new Bible? You've got 75 already, you know. Well, that's not the point, dear. You have one pair of shoes. Why do you need 20 other pair, right? I mean, that, that's how I rationalize it. Now, I tell you, I don't win those arguments very often even though I have unassailable logic. It, it, it just doesn't matter. But the thing is, each of our households has at least probably one Bible, if not more. And most, if not all of us, I say most of us, because I know Johnny Miller doesn't have one of these devices, and some of you don't either, and that's well and fine. But I want you to think about your smartphone. Those of you that have them, we don't leave home without it. <laughs> I like that giggle. We don't leave home without it. We look at it several times a day. If it ever becomes lost, we will frantically seek it, search for it, and find it. And if we don't, it drives us nuts. If we drop it and the screen cracks, life is coming to an end as we know it. But what about God's Bible? What about the Word of the Lord? Do we make sure that we take it with us every day, everywhere we go? Do we look at it several times a day? If we lose it or misplace it, do we search for it frantically? I have a personal thing. You may not care much about this but it drives me nuts when folks just toss their Bibles on the floor or in a pew or in their car. It's just a pet peeve. You, you, you may go, I'll get over it, and that's fine. But here's why it drives me nuts. A Muslim will make sure that their Bible, their Quran, if you will, that it's never on the ground and that when it's on a bookshelf with other books it is the highest most prominent on display and folks that book is a lie but they treat it with such reverence that we could learn from them as to how we ought to regard our Bibles When the book of the law of the Lord is found, it undoubtedly had been lost for a very, very long time. And you see this reflected ultimately throughout the books of the kings. 
You see it in how the people lived. You see it in what they did and what they didn't do. You see it in how they treated one another. There was a preacher who gave his grandson a Bible for his graduation as our seniors who will be recognized this evening will receive from the congregation. And what this preacher wrote in the Bible to his boy upon graduation was a very simple message we could all learn from. He said, this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. And those words ring true still today. I want to give just some practical lessons as it relates to what we heard read a moment ago. And uh, I have to congratulate our reader. He did a fine job with all those Hebrew names, didn't he? Which is not it. That's just cruel for a preacher to choose a passage that has all these funny names. But first of all, I, I want to point out that our response to divine revelation truly reveals our heart. Look with me if your Bible is open to 2 Kings 22 at verse 11. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. This was how they mourned in those days. They would tear their clothes, they would throw ashes upon their head, and various other things that we don't necessarily associate with grieving today. They would, uh, as a symbol of grief and despair, just take their garment and just rend their garment. And there's a portion in, in, in the Bible where it says, don't rend your garments, rend your hearts. For a broken and contrite heart, the Lord will not despise. But Josiah hears the words of the law, and, and, and he rips his clothes in a demonstration of grief. Here he had since the age of 16, now he's 26, been earnestly seeking God. And in his earnest search of God, he's done the best that he could with the knowledge that he had. Then the law of the Lord is found, and he has the opportunity to hear the words of the book of the law. And he hears it and he realizes, I'm still falling short. We are still falling short. No matter how hard you and I try to be as faithful to God as we may, anytime you open your Bible and you read the Word, fired Scripture, you will be led to the same conclusion, we are still falling short. But thank God that He is gracious and patient and loving kind towards us all. Josiah has this mind of hearing the word and, and being brokenhearted over the fact, because if you look in verse 13, what he says there is the wrath of the Lord is great. Great is the wrath of the Lord that's aroused against us. He likely read, if you've ever read the book of Deuteronomy, there, there, there's this whole section where God says, if you're faithful and you, and, and you follow the words of my law and you do what you ought to do, these are all the blessings that I'll give you. But if you are disobedient and you're hard-hearted and you don't listen to the words of the law, here are the curses you can expect to fall upon you. And I'd be willing to guarantee that Josiah heard the portion of the blessings and the cursings uh, curses, rather, and, and, and he said, boy, God's real angry and he's got every right to be. Some people hear the words of the Lord and they just let it go in one ear and out the other. Some people hear the words of the Lord, even in the most of minute manners, and they really try to do what they ought to do. Our response to divine revelation ultimately reveals our heart. David is a man who said, who it is said of, he had a heart after God. Despite all his failings, David still was a man after God's own heart. And so it doesn't mean that we won't fail. It doesn't mean that we won't mess up. 
But when we mess up, do we fess up? And do we straighten up? Or do we just continue on down this same path of, well, I'll just... You, you live how you want to live, and I'll live how we want to live. You know, th this whole thing that people throw at you today. Uh, secondly, what we do now affects future generations. If you notice at the latter part of verse 13, great is the wrath of the Lord that's aroused against us. Why? Because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do all that is according to it concerning us. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I come from a family. And on my mother's side of the family, when we lived in South Nashville, that entire part of my family, uh, you know, you say they're good-hearted people, and you can say they're, you know, they're bless their hearts and all these other things. But the reality is, all the troubles that arose because of that family, the drug abuse, the alcoholism, the having several children by several different women, the being put in prison, all those issues ultimately boiled down to godlessness. Sure, they would say, oh, we believe in God, praise His name, but there's a difference in just giving lip service to it and living like we believe it. And so mom met daddy and they married and uh, we moved. And, and what's interesting, I saw one side of the coin and had my mother not married my stepfather and we moved to that family farm and I'd be surrounded by a family that were church going, that were Christians, that tried to do their best to be obedient to the Lord. I look and I go, if mom had never met dad, what would I be like today? You ever think about that? I, I think about it very often because my cousins, um, many of them on that side of the family, that's the case. Some kind of substance abuse, some in jail, some, you know, it, it's just horrible. So it's, it's interesting to see those two sides of my family. And, and God loves them, and I love them, but, you know, God was not central to their lives. And if I had not had a daddy, a stepfather, a daddy who, who loved the Lord, and, and despite his own failings, who, who tried to do his best, I wouldn't be your preacher today. Some of you may prefer it that way, and that's okay. I will live with it. But if I wasn't a Christian, maybe I'd have never met Stephanie. Maybe I wouldn't have the children that I have. I mean, you think about these things and you think, this is what could have been. But I thank God that that's not what it was. And so I have the responsibility now as, as a husband, as a father, as a Christian individual to do my level best in following God and realizing the need and reliance I should have upon His grace and compassion so that if it would be so kind and gracious in His sight that my children see that and they come to love the Lord too and they live faithfully to the Lord too. Josiah was one who broke the mold. He could have really said, well, I, I, I'm just like my daddy. He's an idolater. I'm just like my granddaddy. He's an even worse idolater. I can turn out just like them. But he said, no, I'm changing my family tree. And some of you need to start changing your family tree and quit blaming mom and dad for everything that has happened in your life and start living your life. You will be the one. I will be the one that when I stand before the Lord on that great day of judgment, I will answer for myself. None of this modern psychological babble will fly with the Lord. Well, my mother didn't love me enough. My father didn't. And God said, I was there to be your father. God is here to be our father. And in the family of the church, younger men regard those men that are older than you as fathers and those women that are older than you as mothers, those that are of your own age as sisters and the men of your own age as brothers. You know, we have a family here in the church. And uh, I've had more mothers in, in church family than I can count. Um, I count several 
here as mothers to me. Uh, Pam Young will be one of the first names I'll mention, and she'll probably, if you don't see me for Sunday school, she will have bludgeoned me because I named her in the assembly. But she's, she's been like a mother to me and to my family. And I love her for it because I'm not easy to parent, I realize. But what we do now affects future generations. Finally, when we suppress God's Word, our lives reflect disrepair. As much as the temple lie there in ruins, unattended, not functioning, cobwebs all over the place, the glory of God appears as but dust and ashes. So too our lives can reflect disrepair when the Word of God doesn't have an influence in our lives. To our graduating seniors, those that have and those that will, this evening, you're going to be honored and you're going to receive a Bible. And I would say, read it. Don't just let it sit on a shelf and collect dust. Sure, there are parts that may be hard to understand, so don't start with that. Start with a part that can be easily understood. And if you get bogged down on some of the difficulties, well, skip over it and come back to it later. But let God's Word have its work in your life. And not just for our seniors, but for all of us. We need God's Word in our life because in the Word of God, we see the heart of God reflected. And though He doesn't speak to us directly today, He has given us His Word by which we may order our lives and conduct ourselves in ways that we can be sure are pleasing in His sight. One of the things that we often pray for, and I don't think it's vain repetition, uh, is, you know, bless us that we can partake of the Lord's Supper in a manner that pleases you. We want to do right before the Lord. But what about, Lord, bless me that I can respond to this person that I really want to scream at in a manner that pleases you. Lord, bless me to have patience with this one who's annoying me so much. Let me be pleasing in your sight in that regard. You know, I, I, I need that prayer every day. Sometimes I think I'm in the wrong profession because I get so tired of people every once in a while. And I'm not saying y'all, but just, you know, uh, I, sometimes you just need a break. But I just go, Lord, give me the strength. Give me... Give me what I need to be like Christ. And thank you for giving me these people. Will you pray with me? And then we'll have our invitation. Our Father in heaven, we bless you and we praise your holy name. Gracious God of heaven, help us to know your word, to let it work in our lives, and to so order our lives, not just in partaking the Lord's Supper, but in everything that we do that we can live and conduct ourselves in manners that are pleasing to you. Father, for the lack of conformity that we have ever demonstrated, we pray your mercy upon us. Forgive us of our transgressions and bless us, Lord, that we can go forward in faithfulness, that we can go forward in being resolved to do your will. Have mercy upon us each, Father. Strengthen us. And may we do all things to your good pleasure. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, God has so given us His plan as to how you're doing it. Sit still. Give me a second. He's given us His plan in His Word as to how we can come into relationship with Him. Jesus Christ has done the heavy lifting. He's done the work. We need to have faith. And it's not just a dead faith that we just say, oh yeah, I, I, I get that, I believe. But it's a faith that because we believe that He is, that we live out the very story of redemption in our own lives. That story that ultimately begins with sanctifying ourselves to the Lord. And we do that in faith by confessing that Christ is our Lord, that we be buried with Him in baptism, 
rising to walk in newness of life, and each day we try bit by bit to be just like Jesus. And so we live out that life and remember what the Lord has said. Unless someone denies himself and takes up his cross and follows me, he can never be my disciple. It starts with self-denial and it constantly goes with self-denial. Live out the gospel message in your life. If you've not started to do so by taking that initial step, we make ourselves available to assist you this morning. Let us know by coming to the front as we stand and sing. This has been It Is Written, presented by the Glendale Road Church of Christ. We welcome your visits and communications at any time. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words impart.